We're going to be in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 24, starting verse 24, and we'll finish chapter 10. As you've noticed, we're going, we're going pretty fast, which isn't necessarily a bad thing. Uh, I, want to, I want to, instead of zooming in on each two or three verses per, per session or five or six verses, I want to sort of zoom out and just get us to look at the big picture of what Paul's writing. 1 Corinthians starting in 9.24. When someone writes a letter, if you're reading a letter from someone, you usually don't spend hours agonizing over what two sentences mean. You usually look at the entire letter or email and try and interpret what's going on from, from the whole thing. So zooming out and taking a bigger picture approach, which means we're not looking at every single verse, we're going a little bit faster. But Paul has one big point in this, uh, in this section. It's about uh, discipline and protecting yourself from bad and evil influences that can easily trip you up. And Paul goes on and talks about examples about how people have been tripped up by this kind of thing in the past. So let's pray, and then we'll, uh, we'll go ahead and do this. And don't let me standing up here stop you from interjecting or asking a question or, or whatever. This is supposed to be an interactive time, not a, not a lecture time. I've never, I've never liked Bible studies, uh, like Sunday school Bible studies, where the person just talks the entire time. I'm like, that's not a Bible study, that's a sermon, which is fine, but it's not... Not really a, no interaction. So let's interrupt me and ask questions if you had any. So let's pray. Dear Lord, we come to you this morning in your son's name. Please help us to understand your word. Help us to hear what Paul says about self-discipline. Help us to want to discipline ourselves, our thought lives, our hearts and our minds to serve you. Help us to be wanting to show grace and kindness and accommodation to people whose consciences are perhaps a bit different than ours. And always use the principle of love and grace as we deal with our Christian brothers and sisters and as we deal with the world with the object of telling them the old, old story of your son and his love so they can join his family too. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, we ended in cha- you know chapters eight and nine. Paul's just talking about how you should be considerate of other people. Some you know sometimes you need to be considerate of uh, of non-believers, and sometimes you need to be considerate of believers who might be tripped up uh, because of bad associations they have with things in the past. You might be engaging in something that's not you know not necessarily a sin. But by doing it, you might trip up someone who just who has bad associations and bad experiences with that thing. And Paul used the uh, the meat sacrifice to idols analogy, and you could apply it in your life to a whole host of different ways. When most people think about this, they usually think of you know when they, when they try and bring the meat sacrifice to idols principle over, they usually think of like gambling or alcoholism or those are obvious ones. But you can apply it in a, in a bunch of different ways. So we ended at nine, chapter 9, verse 23. Now Paul switches to a different, a related subject to talk about um, discipline. And the chapter, I've said this before, but your, your, chapter, your chapter divisions and your verse numberings are not inspired. Those were put there by Bible publishers in the 16th century to help people reference the Bible. They're not original. So um, chapter 9, verse 24 starts a new subject. Um, just because it doesn't start in chapter 10 doesn't mean it's the same subject. Actually, a guy, the guy who put the, the, verse, the verse numbers and the chapter headings in, in, uh, the, the, in our Bibles that printers have adopted ever since did it on a long journey on horseback and carriage to Paris. And sometimes I think that, I think that the bumps in the road made him put the divisions in the wrong places sometimes. Chapter 10 should start here in chapter 924. Okay, what's he talking about in verses uh, uh, 24 to 27? Paul says, Do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one receives the prize? So run that you may obtain it. Every athlete exercises self-control in all things. They do it to receive a perishable wreath, but we an imperishable. So I do not run aimlessly. I do not box as one beating the air, but I discipline my body and keep it under control, lest after preaching to others, I myself should be disqualified. What is he talking about? If you have a 10-year-old daughter, son, or granddaughter who comes to you and says, what on earth is St. Paul talking about? What is this? What is he saying? What's his point? And if no one answers, I'll just call on Samuel. Ah, Claudia. If I'm getting this right, Brent was um, 
was a, a city that was full of um, games and athletic abilities. And so he would have put that in so that they would understand about running the race and, and winning and, and getting the, the yeah. Uh, the impair, the impair, the imperishable wreath. Yeah. So like, uh, you know, and he used a sports analogy, you know, Paul wrote this today, maybe he'd use football and the Seahawks or something like that. So, but what's his point? What does he want them to do? He's using this sports analogy to make them get the point. So what's the point? What's he telling them to do? To bring their body under submission to, um, to make their body, my, ver my version in 27 says makes, make their body a slave. Okay. So he's using the athletic thing. So if you're an athlete, you need to train your body so you your so your conditions you can do what you're supposed to do. So we're still talking about the sports metaphor, but what's his basic what's the metaphor about? You know, you should if you're in football, you should train really hard to make sure you can do what you need to do. Okay, but what's the endure physically and emotionally? Okay. Monty? Well, so that you're enduring and you're growing so that you're affecting the lives of other people into the kingdom. So we need to endure and sacrifice and give of ourselves. Yeah, he's 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 using the Christian. He's saying the Christian life is like a, it's like training for a sports event. You need to train really hard. You need to be really diligent so you can make it to the end. That's what he's saying. It's just like a sports analogy. Like if you're training for a marathon, it's really hard. It takes lots of work. Takes lots of discipline. You know, a lot of focus. But the point is so that you can compete and you can win. And Paul's saying that's that's what the Christian life is like. You need discipline. The Christian life is like discipline. A lot of people are in, a lot of people are in uh, train for a race. Only one person is going to receive the prize. So you need to live, you need to train yourself in godliness. Train yourself so that you're going to be the one who obtains that prize. You need to have self-control in everything. That's what athletes do. And they do it, they work so hard. They train, sweat, pain, injury, all of it to get, in this case, it's a wreath. In our case today, what, a Super Bowl ring? All of it to get the Super Bowl ring? All that effort, all that discipline. And Paul says, but we're, as Christians, we're, we're training ourselves to receive an imperishable wreath, something that, that's not a Super Bowl ring, something that's not going to pass away. So then Paul sort of switches to a boxing metaphor. He's like, so I don't just, you know, I don't just like get out on the track and just sort of you know jog along in a nice easy pace, and then he goes to the boxing thing. You know, I don't just I don't just box as though I'm just beating the air aimlessly. So I, I discipline myself. I discipline myself. I keep guardrails around my life so that I don't mess up. I want to stay on the path. I want to stay disciplined. Have you guys? How many of you guys have read the Pilgrim's Progress? That that story. If you haven't, it's, a, it's such a beautiful book. You should read it again if you haven't read it. I think there's two or three copies in the library. It's such a, John Bunyan wrote that. He was in prison for many years suffering because he was a Baptist in, uh, in England when that wasn't allowed because of the state church mentality. But little Christian, Christian is he's going to the celestial city. It's all a metaphor. The celestial city is eternity, and his journey to get there is, you know, the Christian life with twists and turns and marshes and pits and all sorts of stuff. Um, one little thing, and Christian just gets off the off the wrong path, and disaster strikes, and he has to learn that he needs to stay on the path, stay on the road that God has told him to walk on, and not deviate, no matter what he hears and what he sees, to, you know, to be to be disciplined. And that's what that's what the book's about, and this is the same thing that Paul's talking about here. It's self self control for godliness. And one reason why this is important is that there's a whole bunch of people in Corinth who are just obsessed with now that I'm now that I'm a Christian, I can do many things. I can do many things, and I don't. Uh, there's almost this idea that you you you've been set free by Christ, so you. You don't even really have to worry as much about making sure that you're that you're living the correct way. You had a bunch of people who seem to have thought that uh, now that I'm saved by grace and God will forgive me, I can just do whatever I want and Christ will still forgive me. And Paul is very careful to tell them, "You need to be very. You need to watch. You guys need to watch yourselves." 
Any questions about this? He's going to go on and give examples as to why we need to watch ourselves. What, any thoughts, questions on this one? Okay, so chapter 10. So now he's going to explain why. Because no matter who you are, no matter, what, no matter what year we're living in, no matter what technology we have or don't have, people are people. And people have made the same mistakes over and over for a long time. And people have made lots of mistakes in the past. And the Bible's been written so we can learn from these people's mistakes. What happens when you're not disciplined with your life and your relationship with God? If you become lazy, you become aimless, you stop training for this marathon. This is what he says in verses 1 through 5 in chapter 10. He says, for, meaning he's, he's still on the same subject, I do not want you to be unaware, brothers, that our fathers were all under the cloud, and all passed through the sea, and all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea, and all ate the same spiritual food, all drank the same spiritual drink. For they drank from the spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. Nevertheless, with most of them, God was not pleased, for they were overthrown in the wilderness. What's he talking about here? What are the things that he mentions? What does it mean that our fathers were all under the cloud and all passed through the sea? Yeah, yeah. If you if you read Numbers, if you've read Numbers, you'll know that uh, when the Israelites were in the wilderness, God was leading them to the. He's leading them every day to where He wanted them to camp, and He there's this huge pillar of cloud that stretched from the ground all the way to the sky. You know, what more what more proof do you need that God is with you? There's this cloud stretching from the ground to the sky, and at night, it's a, it's a pillar of fire stretching from the ground to the sky. And all they had to do is follow the cloud, which is God, or Christ. Follow the cloud as it moved. Just go along with it and camp where it stops. That's what they have. I mean, God is literally with them. You know, it's, it's not like, you know, if, if you're a Christian today, the Father, Son, and Spirit uh, indwell within you, and they're in your they're inside you. They've like fused your, you're in union with Christ. Father, Son, and Spirit have sort of fused themselves to your soul. So God's with you now. But God was you know, visibly there then. How would you like to have the comfort of sleeping in your tent and having a, a wall of fire reaching to the sky outside the camp? I mean, God is there, right? He's there. So their fathers, ancestors back in the day, and the people in Corinth are Gentiles, they're not, most of them aren't Jews, but because they're part of the family of God, Paul still calls the Israelites their fathers. Anyone who's part of the family of God in any age is, is family. So our fathers were all, all under the cloud. All of them passed through the sea. All of them saw the Red Sea be parted. Where they were baptized into Moses in the cloud in the sea, meaning they were sort of united with Moses as he marched them through the sea. All ate the same spiritual food, all drank the same spiritual drink. What is that stuff? The spiritual food and the spiritual drink. And the manna? And Tim? Yeah, um, God had Moses strike the rock so the water flowed out of the rock. Yeah. So Paul just gives this like Cliff Notes version. Look at all these cool things. Like amazing things. God is clearly with them. He's not going to let anything happen to them. All of this stuff. Miraculous food, miraculous water, miracles, all designed to make people think, wow, God's with me. But what happened in verse 5? With most of them, God was not pleased, for they were overthrown in the wilderness. What is that? What happened in the wilderness that made God upset? Why? Tim? Disobedient. Okay. Yeah. Were you going to say something, Tim? Oh, yes, you were. I heard something. I can, I can say something. Okay, you say something if you want. Well, the first thing they did, they just went through these miracles and they threw gold in a fire and made a golden calf. And this is the God that led us out of, the, out of Egypt. So they kept denying God and who he was, even though he was there. And then they rebelled against the people that put in the leadership and 
all sorts of yeah, and if you if you read Psalm 95, Psalm, there's a lot of passages in Scripture where the psalmist or a writer talks about what is you know basically these guys what is wrong with them? Look at all these signs that God is with them, and this is just like the the the, the abridged version. I mean, what more sign do you need that God is with you when He protects your camp with a wall of fire at night and a pillar of cloud parts? the Red Sea, feeds you, gives you water in the, in the desert, and still they did not trust God. So that's Paul's point. He's like, even people who had, people who had so much blessing, had so much light from God, and look what happened to them. So he's basically saying to us, so do you think you're, do you think that you're immune from not trusting God? from sort of slipping away and not um, not having the discipline to stay on the path that God has set. We're just as liable to do something stupid like this, because look at these people. Look at all they had. And they messed up. So we can mess up too. All of us can mess up. But um, Psalm 95 talks about the Israelites being overthrown in the wilderness, and uh, Hebrews chapter 3 quotes Psalm 95 and talks about how they weren't faithful. Psalm 106 talks about it. It's, it's, it's in a bunch of places. And if you have if you have a little you know reference thing in the margin of your Bible in verse 5, it'll probably refer you to a bunch of those places where you can read about the Israelites being unfaithful in the wilderness. So they messed up. And they should have known. So we can mess up too. And he goes on, these things took place as examples for us that we might desire evil as they did. So then he goes on, he gives us four things, four, just four examples of what God's people have done before to fall into really bad sin because they weren't disciplined. They didn't watch themselves. What's the first one? What's the first incident in verses, uh, verse 7? Hey, what's, what is the incident he's talking about? So what is that? What incident was that in the Old Testament? He's just quoting a few random things. He assumes most people, he assumes his audience will know them or look it up. Uh, Tim? Yeah, the first one was the golden calf. The golden calf that Moses was up on the mountain. And the people had a big, big party. Yeah. Okay, so yeah, the first one's the golden calf thing. You can read about that in Exodus 32. And Moses sort of, sort of gives a summary of it in Deuteronomy 9, uh, verses 13 to 21, where he just sort of relates this sad, this whole sad event. Yeah, Moses goes up to the mountain to receive revelation from God. The people, you know, they've been immersed in this pagan world in, in Egypt. It's not as though they stayed in Egypt in this little hermetically sealed Tupperware container, totally impact, un, you know, unimpacted by the culture. So they brought all this weird, a lot of weirdness out of Egypt with them. That's why a lot of the law was about... Uh, little basic things like, you know, there are no other gods before me, so you guys need to dump what you've brought with you. You need to commit to me. I'm the only God. You know, basic stuff, because a lot of them had been infected with this pagan worship that they brought with them. And so as soon as Moses goes up to the mountain and he's gone for a while, they demand that they start worshiping a, um, a, a golden calf, uh, one of the... the a, a, pagan, a pagan idolatry sort of ritual. And it says the, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. This is probably, this is probably a reference to some sort of um, sexual promiscuity with fertility cults and other things like that, which I'll talk about in a minute. Um, but it's just, it's idolatry. So Paul says, look what happened to these guys. Don't do what they did. And they're the ones that saw all of that that we just looked at. The same, the same people saw all of that. And then they just turn away from God here in verse 7. Okay, what's the next one? Verse 8. Who knows what this is, what this incident is? This is a test of how well you know the Old Testament. Isn't that where they were with the Boaz women? 
Yes, okay, now we get to talk about uh, fertility cults. How many of you guys, if you've read the Old Testament, you've, you've heard, you've read about Baal or Baal? B-A-A-L, Baal. It's really Baal, but that's okay. I always heard it pronounced as Baal, so that's okay. Okay, and how many of you have always wondered, you know, what on earth is it with this weird Baal thing, and what does it mean? And why are there cultic prostitutes, and what is, what is all of this? If you turn this section in verse 8, it's talking about Numbers 25. A lot of the Israelite uh, men had started to have relations with Moabite Moabite women. Moab is to, if you picture the Jordan River cutting uh, Israel's eastern border, you can look in your map in the back of your Bible. This is one of the cool things I was going to show you, but technology has failed me. So eastern border, of, from your perspective, the eastern border of Israel, you can think of the Jordan River. Moab is down here, the southeast corner-ish area down here. That's Moab. And some Israelite men had begun to have relations with the Moabite women, especially the cultic prostitutes. And God is very angry and demands that people repent. So people come and repent. They gather at the tabernacle and they're you know, saying they're sorry. And at the exact moment they're saying they're sorry, a guy um, sort of sneaks away and grabs a Moabite cultic prostitute and goes in a tent and starts having relations with her. And one of the one of the one of the uh, one of the priests is so enraged he grabs a spear and kills them both as they're in the tent uh, having relations with each other and because of that because of this wickedness and the wickedness in general people just going after these cultic prostitutes um, 23,000 people God struck 23,000 people dead so I want to tell you real quick about the cultic prostitutes I know that's a weird thing to say in Sunday school but um, so um, the world was a lot different back then, and a lot of the pagan nations thought that crops were regulated by, well, everything was, everything was multiple gods. So there's tons of gods around. If you've read about you know, the Greek or Roman gods and goddesses, you can get that idea. There's tons of gods. There's Zeus, there's Apollo, there's Mars, and all sorts of other. Aphrodite, the goddess of love, she's coming on February 14th, so get ready. So, God's everywhere, okay? And a lot of the pagan, a lot of the, a lot of the cultures in this area, in the, the, the Eastern Mediterranean, thought that the crops, how, how well your crops did was based on the favor from the gods. And Baal, and a whole bunch of other Baals, were part of this fertility cult. But it's sort of these are the gods who controlled whether your crops did well or not. And if your crops don't do well, then you die or you starve or you're in really big trouble. So it's kind of important your crops do well. So you need to make sure you keep the fertility gods happy. And they associated the crop, you know, the rains from the the rains from the sky go on the ground and then it makes stuff grow. They they took that as a sexual allegory for because they're fertility gods, um, they took that as some sort of sexual allegory, and they said, we can, make our, we, can, we can excite the gods and make them have our crops be better if we just have lots of sex with each other. The more sex we have with each other, the more the gods will become excited, the more it will rain down on our land, and the more our crops will grow. And you can get the sexual metaphors going on there, which are disturbing, but that's, what's, that's, that's the deal. So you had cultic prostitutes whose job was just have sex with many people. There were men cultic prostitutes too. Have sex with many people, make the gods really excited, and then your crops would be great when springtime came. And so if you're a human being, especially if you're a man, if, if you're told, hey, have sex with as many women as you want, and God will be so happy he'll bless your crops, that sounds pretty good to a lot of men. Not all men, but that can sound, especially if that's the culture you're growing up in, that can sound, you know, good. That's why cultic prostitution was such a strong draw for anyone, but really especially for the Israelite men. Um, so that's what it's about. I know you probably didn't come here to hear this on Sunday, but that's what it's about. That's why it's stuck with the Israelites all throughout the Old Testament until the exile. So that when you see cultic prostitutes in the Bible, in the Old Testament, think some version of what I, of what I just said, whether you want to or not, but that, that's, that's what was happening. 
So they did that. God's still with them in the tabernacle. And they still ignored God, had relations with cultic prostitutes, offered incense to the, to the fertility gods after the act was consummated, and they, many of them were participating in this entire thing. Okay, what's, what's, the, what's the next example? We must not put Christ to the test, as some of them did and were destroyed by serpents. This is a more obscure one. Jesus mentions this one in John chapter 3. This is the, this is the if you look at the serpent on the pole, you'll live thing. It is, it's in Numbers 21. It's a, it's a horribly infamous incident where people are complaining to Moses about how they don't have enough food or water, and so God sends a plague of snakes to bite and kill many people, and they have to repent and say they're sorry, and then they're saved. Uh, but the point is, is that Moses has given them food and water you know, plenty of times, but it's not, it's not good enough. The man is not good enough. The water is not good enough. And this, uh, this, this incident is in Numbers 21, verses 4 through 9. And then the next incident is don't grumble, and com- don't grumble or complain, as some of them did and were destroyed by the destroyer. That's probably talking about Korah's rebellion in Numbers, uh, Numbers 16, where Korah and a bunch of other people sort of mount a rebellion against Moses and Aaron, and um, God basically makes the earth have a sinkhole and swallows Korah and all the people who are with him and kills them instantly. He says, now these things happen to them as an example, but they were written down for our instruction on whom the end of the ages has come. And then his point is what I mentioned before. Therefore, let anyone who thinks that he stands take heed lest he fall. So any of you, any of us can fall into the same kind of trap. I don't think any of us are going to go visit cultic prostitutes, but the sins are different today, but it's still the same thing. Anyone can mess up. You need to watch yourself. We all need to watch ourselves. We need to have discipline. We can't have a lazy Christian life watching the influences that come into our life because it's very easy to start slipping away. It's sometimes easy to read the Bible like cardboard, but do you think that any of these people, do you think that if you'd asked the people the golden calf incident, do you hate God? Don't you know what he's done for you? Do you think they would have said, yes, I hate him? Probably not. You know, these, these aren't Looney Tunes characters. You know, uh, this, you know, people are complicated. I don't think they actually hate God when they made the golden calf, but they're betraying him. I don't think that the people literally hated God when they complained to Moses. They just don't trust God, and they're not happy with what, they're, with, with what they've been given. They want more. So it's not that these people all hate God. So if you think, well, I don't hate God, so... You know, there's no, this doesn't really apply to me. It's not about hating God. It's about not giving him all your loyalty and trust. And all of these people made the mistake. So we could do the same thing in our own lives. Any thoughts about that before I go on to verse 14? Or any examples Paul gave or anything? Maybe I will go down to the floor next time because no one wants to talk to me when I'm up here, when I'm high and lifted up. All right. All right, verses 14 to 22. So he's sort of circling back. He says, what's his point? Therefore, my beloved, flee from idolatry. Okay, what is idolatry? And I think we'll spend a few minutes here. We might not cover the rest of chapter 10, but verses 23 to the end are about being considerate to one another, and we already chatted about that. So I'm fine if we don't make it much further than this. What's idolatry, if you could sum it up? Flee from idolatry. Samuel. Worshiping idols. Okay. So is idolatry only if I worship, say I worship this timer. Very expensive timer. It was $1.98 at Amazon. It was, it was three forty eight for two. So I bought two. So if if uh, is idolatry only worship and worship of an object, or is it something else? It's anything you put above. Oh, Monty just came in and just gave the definition without having a chance to for anyone else to say anything. But yeah, I think idolatry is not just worshiping an object in this culture. 
it is, you know, it is an object. You know, Isaiah, in uh, many places in Isaiah, it talks about um, uh, people making gods of wood and stone and how foolish it is. It's somewhere in the, it's somewhere in the mid-40s, 44. I'm blanking out right now. But there's a really famous section uh, where Isaiah talks about how foolish all of that is. So, but in this culture, it's a, it's a physical object that represents something, an idol of a god of some sort. And if you, especially if you come from uh, uh, from a, like religions from the East, you still have some of that stuff. But for many people in the West, many people don't really worship an object. So you can read this and you can say, yeah, well, I don't have any of those at home, so it's all good. But idolatry is not just an object. It's what, where is your, where is your heart? If you look at your heart, you look at your heart and mind, is God on the throne there, or is something else sort of alongside him? It's about where your heart is. There is a passage in Ezekiel 14 that I wanted to, I wanted to show you that talks about this. Where did they move Ezekiel? I see Ezra. Ah, there it is. Okay, Ezekiel 14, listen to what he says, and especially the highlighted uh, portion. Certain of the elders of Israel came to me and sat before me. The Lord came, the word of the Lord came to me, son of man. These men have taken their idols into their hearts and set the stumbling block of their iniquity before their faces. Should I indeed let myself be consulted by them? Therefore speak to them and say to them, thus says the Lord God, any one of the house of Israel who takes his idols into his heart and sets the stumbling block of his iniquity before his face and yet comes to the prophet, I, the Lord, will answer him. And he goes on and he says to tell them, repent and turn away from your idols and turn away your faces from all your abominations. For any one of the house of Israel or of the strangers who sojourn in Israel, who separates himself from me, taking his idols into his heart and putting the stumbling block of his, in, of his iniquity before his face, and yet comes to a prophet to consult me through him, I, the Lord, will answer him, will answer him myself. So what, is this, what does this tell us about idolatry? Yeah, it's it's if they're in this case, it's a physical, you know, it's a physical idol of another god that they've, but it, it's it's latched onto their heart, their heart, their affections, their mind, their heart are with this false idol that they're worshiping. But they're still coming to God. They're still coming to the temple. They're still coming to well, they're not in the temple. That Ezekiel's in exile right now. But they're they're still coming to Ezekiel. They're still claiming that they belong to God, but they're also doing this thing over here. And Ezekiel, God says they've taken their idols into their heart. So the point is, when he says flee from idolatry, all of us should think about what is it? Are there things besides God or maybe opposed to God that have captured our hearts, that have captured your heart? And to really think about that, Auntie. This sounds very revealing about me, but food, which is something everybody needs, but I was putting it to run to when I had issues, when I had hurts, when I was depressed, food became my idol, and yet I was going to church, I was learning, I was doing all kinds of things, until one day God really pointed out, food was actually more important to me than him, that I needed to be going to him with my issues not to food. So it can be something that's a good thing and we can turn it and it becomes wrong in our hearts. What, what else do you guys think? You don't have to share personally or you could sanitize it, but that, that idea that what has captured you, what has captured you instead of God or what do you turn to instead of God for comfort, for answers, for help? Claudia. Um, retail therapy. <laughs> <laughs> what is that? What is that? Like Dr. Phil? Retail therapy means you go out and shop when you're in there. Oh, never mind, never mind. I was a little off there. Okay. Shopping. Okay, now I understand. Okay. At least it wasn't Dr. Phil. You know, you're 
you're down at the dumps and so yeah. you're and spend money that you really shouldn't be spending. Wanda. I think relationships too. Yeah, it's it's really, and you, you you can come up with a million examples, but if there is something in your life that has that you go to instead of God, or that his captures your passion, your passion and your energy and your enthusiasm more than God, and if that thing were taken away from you, you would be lost, or you would be very depressed, or you don't know if you'd be able to function. That might be. Air conditioning doesn't count, but that could be something that you've put, you've allowed to go into your life that is supplementing God's role as the Lord and King and ruler of your life. What about what about our our, our devices? What about phones? You know, back in two thousand seven, when the iPhone was released, before that, they were just normal phones, just flip phones. And then smartphone was released with the new, the first iPhone, and the world changed 13 years ago. Think about what it's like to live without a mobile device. Well, think about how attached you are to it. Is it an unhealthy attachment? Does it consume your life? Do you spend do three hours go by and you don't even realize what's happened because you've been consumed staring into the glow of your screen? And it could be a million different things. That doesn't mean technology is bad, but if something has captured your heart in place of God, then there's, there's a problem. All of these things that uh, Paul mentioned, all of these things that Paul mentioned here are forms of idolatry. The work tablet, whatever, smash you later. Okay, so um, the golden calf incident, that's more close to idolatry because they made an object and they danced around and worshipped and probably did things with one another. And that's why Moses was so enraged when he came down the mountain. The sexual immorality, the putting God to the test and grumbling and complaining, the all of that. All of these things are different ways to not be loyal and trust God. Something else has supplemented God to the point where you're literally angry at God and railing against the man who led you through the middle of the Red Sea because you don't like the food that you have. You don't like the water that you have. You don't believe that God's going to protect you. Now, none of them are bowing down to idols, but the point is they're not trusting God. They're not content with what God has given them either. Their, their, their appetites are their God in that case, or their sexual desires are their God in that case. They've betrayed God. Idolatry is, you know, at its core, is a, is a betrayal of God. Instead of God being on the throne in your life, something else is either there with him or sort of pushed him down a notch or two. And that's the point. That's what idolatry is. When you just, when you just get, it, get right down to it, that's what idolatry is. This is... All right. This is not 1 Corinthians 10. Aha. Therefore, let anyone who thinks that he stands take heed lest he fall. Flee from idolatry. And then he gives this long example about um, you can't participate in the Lord's Supper, for example, and then go participate in a, sa in a ceremony that offers sacrifices to, to demons. You can't do both. You have to choose one. You can't flirt with both things. You can't be loyal to God, but then be loyal to someone else. You can't claim that you're being faithful in your marriage when you're having an affair with someone else. You can say whatever you want, it's not true. And everyone gets that on a, you know, on a human level. Everyone gets that. That's why God compares Israel to a, to a bride who's left him, like spiritual adultery. She's betrayed him, she's cheated on him, and she's left him. That's why there's all these analogies. That's why the church is the bride and Christ is the husband. Christ is, is, is sort of marrying the church in this analogy. Because it gets the, isn't that a powerful imagery 
about unfaithfulness because we all get it so easily. No one needs to explain the concept of unfaithfulness. I love you so much, but then there's this on the side. And everyone's going to say, no, there's something wrong. So that that imagery, even even 3,000 years ago, it really hit home with people because they got it. And that's all Paul's saying here in this section that we're not going to go over verse by verse. If you say that you participate in the body and blood of Christ through the Lord's Supper, and you say you belong to him, and you take the Lord's Supper, how can you go out and participate in another, uh, in another sort of thing with, uh, with a pagan sacrifice? But you can translate it to today and say, how can, you, how can you take the Lord's Supper and confess that you belong to Christ? His blood was shed for you. His body was given for you. How can you do that and just pledge loyalty to the Lord and then immediately go out and live as though the Lord isn't your master? You can't do that. You can't be unfaithful to God like that. And all Paul's point is, is to say, we need to, we need to discipline ourselves and we need to discipline ourselves really well. If you want to read a passage that really gets this spiritual adultery thing home, there's two passages in Ezekiel you can read, and it's really it's helpful. I think you'll really get it. It's Ezekiel 16. Ezekiel 16, where God compares um, the Israelites to, um, to an unfaithful bride. First, he compares the Israelites to a newborn child that's tossed in a garbage heap and abandoned crying and about ready to die, and God's, God is the one who comes along and takes pity and rescues her, raises her up, and then she left him. And then he switches metaphors right in the middle of this analogy, and he says, now you're like, uh, you're, like a, uh, you're like a beautiful woman who I've married, I've given everything to, I gave you everything I had. I married you, I've done everything for you, and what did you do? You just cheated on me with 500 people and you liked it. And God's basically saying, so what, what, what gives? What more was I supposed to do for you? And that gets the point across. And Ezekiel 23 is, it's, Ezekiel 23 is probably the most graphic description of this sexual, of this you know, spiritual adultery. Um, he gives an example of two, of two uh, sisters, two sisters who have betrayed a parent. And he uses this adultery imagery. We were actually doing devotions with it last night at home, and it was so it was so blunt. I skipped over a few verses and didn't actually read them, but it, it really gets the point across. Ezekiel 16 and Ezekiel 23. And this is not this is not Paul's not meant Paul's not trying to smash you over the head. Paul's saying, way back in chapter nine, verse twenty-four. Guys, we need to be disciplined in our lives. We really need to be disciplined because a lot of people who've seen more than we have have really gone off into left field. Not even in left field. They've sort of left left field and gone into the parking lot beyond. So a lot of people who've seen a lot of things, more than we have, have messed up really bad. So we might mess up too. He says we should learn from their examples. We should learn what happened to them. We should learn their mistakes so that we don't mess up too, because we could. Anyone who thinks he's not, take heed lest he, lest he falls. Let anyone who thinks that he stands take heed lest he fall. No temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man. God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond your ability, but with the temptation he'll also provide the way of escape that you may be able to endure it. If we're actually looking to escape the temptation... How many times have we have, have all of us like done something or started down a road where we know something bad, something unholy is about to happen, and there's so many off ramps that come our way, and we're just like, I don't see those off ramps. They just don't. They're just not there. It's not there. Just just keep going. The discipline, Tim. Yeah, well, it's it's more than that. If you're participating in these sins, you're not living for the gospel. You're wiping out the purpose of the gospel. And so, in sharing the gospel, you're not going to win, or you're not going to convict people to come to Christ. Yeah, I mean, that's that's definitely true. Anyone else have any, have any thoughts? You always have something, Gail. What are your thoughts? I just got here. 
Oh, fine. That's okay. Yeah. The point is self-discipline. We all need to be disciplined in our lives because we can end up just like the Israelites did. But we have their examples. We know how they messed up. We have it. We can read it. We can learn from it. And we should never be prideful thinking, well, that was back then. They were ignorant you know, Stone Age morons or something. But we're smart because we have Wi-Fi, right? Uh, no, we're people. And we can make the exact same mistakes. So Paul wants us to be, to be disciplined. He closes out the chapter from verses 23 onward. He, went back, he goes back to the have consideration for other people thing that he mentioned before. And as he did before, he wants to leave us with this. Verses 31 to 33, whatever you eat or drink, whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Give no offense to Jews or Greeks or to the church of God, just as I try to please everyone in everything I do, not seeking my own advantage, but that of many that they may be saved. As Tim said, if you're not self-disciplined in your spiritual life and you run off the rails, how could this ever be a mission that's really in your mind? It's not going to be. You need to be disciplined in your life so that you can be the little light for Christ that, that you are, that he's put you where you are to be. If you look at little lights on a Christmas tree, they're not very light, especially the ones that aren't LEDs. They're not very bright, but the cumulative effect of all the lights on the Christmas tree make it, it really turns it into something. We are ordinary people. A lot of us are just ordinary, boring people, which isn't a bad thing. Where none of us are going to be remembered three generations from now. How many of you know your great grandparents and remember their names and know anything about them? That doesn't mean we're insignificant. It means that we're ordinary people who God has put in particular places to reach the people around us. We're not anything special. We're not this bright, shining, one million megawatt spotlight. We're little Christmas lights on a Christmas tree. But the impact of all of us doing our own little part in our own little bubbles has a cumulative effect that's much bigger than our little light has a, to a total effect of all God's people doing that in their own little orbits. And we need to be self-disciplined in our personal lives because if we're not, we're never going to be able to do, we're never going to be able to do anything like that. Which is why Paul closes and says, be imitators of me as I am of Christ. Paul says, follow, follow my example, please. So we need to be disciplined so we can be the kind of people for Christ that we need to be. Let's pray, and we'll get ready for our, uh, our morning service. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we come to you this morning in your Son's name. We thank you for who you are. We thank you for salvation. Please have your Holy Spirit convict our hearts, search our hearts, search our minds. Help us to think about ways that we are disappointing you, ways that we're not living up to the calling you've given us. And help us not to wallow in despair, but to have hope through your Holy Spirit to give us, give us wisdom and how we can how we can correct these things, how we can address them, give us hope about forgiveness and grace and mercy, and help us just to be people who want to, who want to be changed bit by bit to be more like you every single day, and help us to want to serve you in spirit and in truth. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.